Welcome back to the highway with Kyle Shutt. I am Kyle Shutt, and y'all may not know this about me, but whenever I first moved to Austin way back in the year of our Lord, 2000 and zero, all I wanted to do was play in grindcore bands. I was obsessed with Pig Destroyer, Employer Employee, Converge, anything super extreme. I was all about it. So it is my pleasure today to have on the program Mr. Mick Harris, the man who invented the term grindcore and the original drummer for Napalm Death. If you like what you've been hearing on the program, hit that subscribe button, follow this show, double kick a bass drum until you can't breathe. You do whatever you got to do to make sure that you don't miss a single episode. And if you want to go one step further, you can find us at patreon.com slash the highway. Throw a few dollars in my proverbial hat and help me keep these lights on. You can get yourself access to next week's episode a week early. You can get some Wild Kyle merchandise. You can even get a video guitar lesson from me once a month. I do it all for you people. We've got to give some love to our wonderful sponsors, Heil Sound. Because if you like the way I sound, it's because there's a Heil in front of me. What a napalm death free jazz and cool keith have in common the only way to find out is to do things my way the highway what's going on mick I'm all right, man. I'm doing fine, We've had dude. some rain. Yeah, we've had a lot of rain today. All day it's rained, so it all depends how you want to look at it. As a fisherman, it's good because I'm off to the river tomorrow and we could do we could do with a bit of uh, a bit of the wet stuff on there, so that's pretty cool. Nice, though. nice. Are you still in Birmingham? Yeah, I'm never going to escape from here, am I? <laughs> you want to pay for me to move? <laughs> never, never. I could never afford that. <laughs> Well, thanks so much for coming on the program. I really appreciate it, man. Um, yeah, this uh, cool. little backstory. We just uh, try to talk to, to people from all genres and all kind of creative walks of life to uh, just see what kind of got them into it. Um, I'm a big fan. Just wanted to say that. And also, uh, uh, the first thing I wanted to ask you is that, uh, you know, growing up, uh, I'm, I'm 38 right now. So uh, kind of like in the late 90s, I got really into extreme music. Mostly because of, you know, bands like, you know, like Napalm Death or uh, Converge. Morbid Angel, things like that, you know. Um, but that that was, you know, what got me into that. But I just wanted to ask, like, you're the guy that invented the term grindcore, you know. <laughs> so, like, what was what was the musical landscape at the time, like, that, that made you want to play such extreme music? Well, you know, the thing grindcore, it's sort of, I was always obsessed with dirty, distorted, overdriven fuzz bass. It was mm-hmm. like, that comes from punk, you know what I mean? That's yeah. where I came from punk and and john peel so alternative indie music or whatever term you want to call it um so you know a lot less genres then you know what right. i mean it's, <laughs> you know, it's it was a lot easier to follow you know what i mean it was this this or that but anyway just going with the whole punk thing it was you know, that's what suited me as a kid didn't it you know mm. what i mean growing up no friends and being a hyperactive little bastard which i still am it just it suited me locking myself in the bedroom and having a good cousin that turned me on to good punk music and then him telling me to discover John Peel, which he said would do that. And it did that. Exactly. Yeah. No John Peel, forget about it. That was my path. You know what I mean? It's, I, I, you know, you say extreme music. Maybe, yes. You know what I mean? I just looked for music that was challenging. That, that was me as a child. I always looked for, I guess, the whole thing with punk leading to hardcore. Hardcore for me was faster. Mm-hmm. And I always looked for speed. Couldn't help it. You know what I mean? What did we have? You know, if we go back again, we had Discharge, which... Wow, you know what I mean? What is discharge done? A lot, you know what I mean? What, right. what, you know, we can't get that. But, you know, I loved things like discharge, disorder, Chaos UK. Now, again, you uh, without the Chaos UK and disorder, I called that the hardcore beat. And for me, it was just, I just wanted to play the hardcore beat faster. Mm. You know what I mean? You've got, that'd be your standard Chaos UK or disorder, but typical Mick Harris when eventually I did get to play drums because these would have been things I listened to which were like the precursors and right. just being you know the uh, the hyperactive as I said just that's what I had to get on but not forgetting things like farts the neos the neos EP you know, you know the hazard band gets the Martian brain squeeze this was a big thing for me I know I always talk siege and deep wound we can't forget about those 
extreme, you know what I mean, pre-blasters, you know what I mean, but super fast, hardcore drummers, as I, I would call them, and, you know, stuff like, you know, the Neos from Canada, that I think was the first time I ever, you know, people have asked this, I think someone asked recently, you know, we know you like Siege, Mick, and I said, oh, definitely, and Deep Wound, you know what I mean, look at the speed of that EP, but I think, I've got to say, the Neos was a big one for me, super fast, super tight, you know what I mean, just nice. these free guys, He's going mad in the garage, getting that garage sound, that DIY you know, punk production, which mm. still stands today. You know what I mean, it's it still means a lot for me today to have that DIY punk sound, which still goes into my production and the way I work. So I don't know if I've gone off track there, but uh, I've tried to answer. <laughs> no, no, that's that's awesome, man. And uh, especially talking about John Peel, like that was um, he was just a name to me. I never had the pleasure to meet him or, or go on his program. He had passed by the time uh, that my band would have been to the level of being able to get on that program. But yeah, what was that like uh, loading in and, and uh, doing your own Peel session? Well, you can imagine, I'll get it. Yeah, you know, I go home. My mum says, um, Mike, um, somebody from the BBC. What do you mean somebody from the BBC, my mum? <laughs> She'd never write anything down. And she was like, oh, somebody from the BBC court. They want you to record, mum. What details you got? And classic me, I guarantee. I got very overexcited, probably ranty, jumped up and down a little bit, probably had a little tantrum. <laughs> oh, yes. And uh, she said, uh, he said he'd call you back if you didn't call him. Well, I obviously can't call. You didn't take a number. He called back. And it was John Waters who was um, John Peel's producer. And he called back just to say, Mick, um, I don't know if you got my message, but... Um, John has asked me, he, he, he introduced himself, he says, John has asked me to um, invite you guys to come and do a Peel session, Sunday the so-and-so, and I was like, oh man, you've just blown me away there, and I said, get ready for this, I said, we've got no equipment, how about that, <laughs> no serious, <laughs> I owned, dr yeah, yeah, I owned drumsticks, I owned a pack of cymbals, and my bass drum pedal. I still didn't have a drum kit at this time. No that's, drum that's kit. That's kind of a typical thing, though, more so, I think, in the UK and Europe, is where like, clubs have their own back lines and stuff. Like, whereas in the States, everybody like, have to have your... Yeah. We were so-called a band. You know what yeah. I mean, we didn't own anything. We, we Bill had his guitar, and he had his little, <laughs> you know, little guitar up there. I never had a drum kit. Cal never had a drum kit. We, I don't want to go there, but the little time I did have a drum kit, it didn't work out because of a local police officer that killed it for me okay but yeah. maybe he didn't it because i wouldn't have done what i did if i'd practiced i think and that's the only reason i want to get that in so i never practiced it was all self-taught and luckily napalm so many gigs and me just oh as i say going back to that hyper thing of just wanting to get behind and do it and just let it rip mm. and that's the only way that i can describe it so um getting a call from peel as to say we you know he, he he, he, he tells us what time we need to be there. He also gives me two addresses for London backline companies. He said, they'll be able to help you, Mick. Just give these a call. So I phone up Earache. Earache sort of van for us. Get in touch with the rest of the band. The gear's organised. We go down. You can imagine I'm bouncing off, as I always was, bouncing off the ceiling of the van, being told to calm down. Worst thing you could say, I tell me to calm down. It's going to go and... <laughs> <laughs> That's just how it is. But yeah, yeah, you can imagine. We're on our way down there. Me, Bill, Lee and Shane. And wow, what a day. You know I mean, we turn up and, you know, the Peel Sessions, uh, I don't know if you're aware, you were given usually it was class 20 minutes and usually bands did four, four tracks. Mm. Yeah, yo, there's your 20 minutes or within the 20 minutes. Yeah. So most bands four tracks so dale griffin the producer comes to me and he said all right i've been told to approach you mick i'm dale i'm the i'm the producer i work the peel sessions here this is how it works and and so uh, what will you be doing i said yeah we're doing 12 songs and he looked at me and he said no 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 you don't understand i said i don't understand. <laughs> and he said no no you don't understand he said we don't have time for 12 songs and i said 12 songs, mate, four and a half minutes. He just looked at me and he like mumbled and he said, oh, oh, shall we just get on with the session? I don't think, he went straight over his head. He must have been like, you what, 12 songs, four and a half minutes. <laughs> so that was it. So we have a quick sound check that because the Peel sessions run to a tight schedule. I think you're given something like six and a half hours to get in, 
line check and you do you do that live the only thing that isn't right. live is the vocal that's how it's always run wicked room great acoustics lovely microphones you're set up in there there's no dividers it just captures that raw raw sound mm. that we all love those peel sessions for and you know a lot of the time the peel tracks were better than the album tracks because they were raw they caught the energy and i'm sorry that first peel session i could listen to it now i've not heard it for years but people say it just it, it's, it's just an absolute whirlwind of a, it sounds faster than it is. It, the whole thing, they captured that energy of us going in there hyper and just let's do it. And you can imagine it was a, a traffic light system and we, we've been in little studios, smelly studios. You know what I mean? We've all been in those, haven't we? Where you come out after two hours of jam, man, a smell of cigarettes and all that other nonsense that's been all the years within these old rehearsal rooms and studios. But no, you go there, the Murdy Vale, oh, this is nice, isn't it? This is very refined. But <laughs> system and i think i had to tell him again look we're doing 12 tracks three tracks each each block there's your four blocks i said it's four and a half minutes and he, i think he still didn't get it but so we do the first track don't ask me what it is can't remember and i said well, we're ready for the next two and i think that's when he got it okay they want to do three tracks quickly check it Go and do the next for it. And he got it. It finally clicked. We did that session. We recorded it and mixed. Um, it was done in, I don't know, about four hours, four and a half hours. I know we got out of there early. We were all super psyched. One thing you could never have, which we're really disappointed with, I took a tape down with me. I always had a cassette to give to a sound guy, you know, for doing it. Do, can you do us a soundboard tape, please? And they were always moody engineers about doing soundboard tapes. I don't know what that, I don't know what that's about. It, it always felt like a chore you know, to go and ask, excuse me, Mr. M, could you do a, a live board? Turn? No, no, it's not plugged in. It is plugged in. I don't know if you've been there, but back <laughs> in the day, it used to be that way. They just couldn't be bothered. They'd give you a load of, it's not plugged in. It is plugged in. But they wouldn't give us a cassette. We were told you do not get a duplicate of the session. Right. That's terms and contracts. So a little bit disappointed. I pressed, but they were like, no, I produced my tape as a little kid, you can imagine. Please. No, I'm sorry. You have to broadcast. And, you know, it did peel broadcast it. And I think he, when he really liked a session, he'd play it three, four times. And that's what he did on this. He was, he loved it, didn't he? He opened up a whole, he just opened up a worm box, didn't he? And people discovered and... Those that discovered Napalm being extreme like yourself went on to discover other great extremes and other dynamics in music and other sonics, which, you know, you, as you said to yourself, you like to cover all genres and particularly those, you know, in extreme music. And that's how I saw Peel. We didn't term extreme, but just someone that could expand and take you on that sonic journey. And there's never been anyone like that since. So he was my music teacher and it was a sad day when he when he passed away i was fishing that day i remember and i got a text message off a friend and it, it was just bang it was a mike tyson flat out and that's how it felt i was numb and a little tear and i thought i can't fish yeah not that on my mind you know what i mean i'm just gonna pack up i need to go you know what i mean and yeah you know what i mean one of them just one of them genuine people that did it his way and respect to that he played what he wanted to play he wasn't told and for the bbc as well how amazing yeah how amazing get that wouldn't happen now it would not happen and his original show which i say i started to listen to october 1979 his original show run monday tuesday wednesday thursday night and it was 10 p.m till 12 p.m so I was there. My mum and dad never had a problem with me. Mike's up in his room. Oh, yeah. And I had a dual tape machine as well. I had this big Amstrad blaster, these ghetto blasters, as we called them. Take that down to the park and blast the punk. <laughs> I mean, but, but anyway, I had the dual tape machine and, and, and it would record both ends. So I had the cassette ready and you'd have the 10 o'clock news first with the, and you'd wait for that. And so you got this, you, I just knew the silence is coming up and boosh, record straight away because I wasn't missing anything. Because sometimes Peel would straight away play a track. You wouldn't oh, introduce yeah. nothing and you didn't want to miss anything because that could be vital. And then the end of every recording, I'd call it a night. That'd be it for me. Turn it off. 
turn the tape deck off, get up for get up for school, come back from school, and that's when I'd go through my tape, and that's when I'd edit my tapes from having the jewel of the, the stuff I liked, and I'd have my little notepad, and I'd make a note of the stuff that I needed. And we only had a couple of record shops that made an effort in Birmingham. Um, a personal effort to try and track down so and they couldn't always of course they couldn't but luckily we had several record shops like rockers records inferno records that a bit more personal and you know coming off the back of yo know, punk and you know they stocked a lot of reggae and dub as well so all of that was in the mix and yeah it was it was, it was just there it's just there God, that's a great experience, man. Like, radio was such a huge part of uh, my musical education too. But uh, we didn't have anything like that in the states. By the time I started listening to the radio, there was, you know, FM was kind of already on the way down. But uh, that, that that that's so rad, man. But uh, yeah, what what was it like? Um, I'm trying to. I mean, I don't know like how extensively y'all toured, but what what was the uh, the tour landscape like back in those days? Like driving around playing like literally like a kind of music people hadn't heard before. You know, like just getting, like how many bars did you get kicked out? Of? <laughs> no, I never got kicked out. But let me tell you, it was always my God, look at this. That was the expression. People were just like, oh wow, it was okay. There was lots of gigs. It was hectic. There was mm-hmm. no time to think about it. It was in backs of vans doing it for next to nothing, just enough to pay for petrol, to pay for the van rental and to pay for the driver. We didn't care. We slept wherever we did. We put our sleeping bags in. It was, I'm glad I had that experience, you know what I mean? Because that's how I thought it was. And I got to witness what I thought it was. And it wasn't always good, glamour, yeah, glamour there, but it was doing it the right way. Back of a van, small stages, packed, sweaty little clubs, you know what I mean? Dripping off the ceiling and just, wow, just... Getting up there and just, we were just blasting. You know, what an expert, what, what, what a joy. And I still say today, I'm privileged that I can get up there and do what I do and hopefully turn people on. And today it's all big bass and drones. And, you know, back then it was blasting, but still the same. It's, you know, there's still an extreme dynamic there. And it's, again, the same thing. I can blast them with bass. Back then we were blasting them with the napalm growing core. So just to see faces of, wow and laughter and is this really happening and people would some people would come along not to laugh but to be just like we've heard of this band napalm they go super fast <laughs> so yeah we had all of that but it was all good it was always a good it was it, there's no no negatives there and there's no time for thinking it was just like gig 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 small tours and and it was just get in the back of the van and go do it. We probably matured as because we did as a little bit as, as, as musicians, songs change, but it was still the we just love doing this. Let's just get in the back of the van and let's just go blast the venue. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's what it was. Very lucky, very, very lucky we were that, you know, Ear Eight picked up on it after Pusshead uh wrote a very good scene report, what he'd heard. Um, about Napalm, we sent Pusshead the A side of Scum because uh, you know it's made up of mm. two lineups mm-hmm. recordings. So I never heard back off Pusshead, um, and you know it was going to be a split with Atavistic, another English hardcore band. That never happened, and you know, eventually you know, Justin has moved on to play drums in Head of David. I'm sort of left after Nick goes on to university and I want to continue with it. It's a big thought thing. Should I do this? I'm not an original member myself, but I felt I put a year and what, 14 months, a little bit more into this. I put everything into it. I believed in what I was doing and I thought, well, I've been involved in shaping this, the style that Napalm, you know, through 86 and, and how it all become for the B side, you know, playing guitar on my stupid two-stringer, but hey, it wrote those songs, you know what I mean? And, and recently, you know, the, na- the bo- guy's writing a napalm book and I pulled out my little envelope of my napalm death tablature, which is B-side of Scum, Fito, Mentally Murdered, Harmony Corruption, Mass Appeal, Madness, and there's even a cassette in there. And he said, oh, man, I'd like to hear that. And I said, no, no, that's not even going in a cassette. That's That would have been tracks after Harmony Corruption, you know what I mean? Oh, but I've got, to take, I've got to take some photos of that for the book. He wants a picture of... Because I explained how I wrote my tablature and how Bill, like that, sorry, Bill was the best napalm guitarist 
and Jesse. He, he's my favorite guitarist of all time. Honestly, like fucking Billy Steer, dude. That dude fucking rips. Oh my god. Well, you know what I've got to say about Billy is this: we got on so well. You know, I bet, met Bill at the Mermaid, where it all went off, where I discovered Napalm Death, and then where I got to play with Napalm Death and the Saturday matinee hardcore matinees that Daz Russell would put on would bring people from all over the country, and that's where I met Bill. And I didn't know Bill was doing a magazine called Phoenix Militia at the time, but. I'd been told about it mm -hmm. by Mitch Dickinson on the scene terror. Then later brought Mitch Dickinson was the first to come to the mermaid. Shane was pissed about that because he was like, mm, Mitch has been to Birmingham before me. It took a couple of gigs before <laughs> Shane came. And I think Shane finally came to Birmingham in about March or April of 86. And I just remember going straight up to Shane and uh, I called him Donut and he just laughed. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm sorry, man. And there he was in his denim with all his you know, metal patches on and we hit it off straight away because Shane, as you know, huge genocide fan and uh, turned me on to it. We'd been tape trading for a couple of months prior to this and... So he was really happy to meet me and me him, and it was a napalm gig. His first time being at the Mermaid, an all-day festival. I think Heresy was on, Concrete Socks, Napalm, Amoebics, Chaos UK, you know, mental ordeal. Like, really killer mental ordeal, and that was it. You know what I mean, it's uh, that, that's how it sort of started there. And um, as you know, the, the scene report, Pusshead didn't pick up on it. Digby was the one that was interested. He'd seen Napalm live with the three of us, me, Nick and Justin, and he got wind of Justin had left. And we'd done a couple of gigs with Frank Healy from, uh, who plays, used to play bass in Benediction, and a few other bands, Cerebral Fix, um, Sacrilege, and Memoriam, his new band now. And so he actually played guitar for Napalm for about three months, about November, December, January. So the end of 86 into 87, but it, it just didn't work, okay? It was, I'm not going to explain, okay? But, <laughs> you know, but yeah, it's just, it didn't happen, which was a real shame because Frank was a big fan and had followed it and was there. And it just didn't work anyway. So I get in touch with Bill because we'd, we'd become great friends, continued tape trading. You know, I was constantly seeing him when he was coming to Birmingham to these matinees, and we'd always go back to Jim Whiteley's flat, who, as you know, was the bass player on the B-side of Scum. And that's where we'd all go back to at the end of one of these hardcore matinees. They'd finish at 11, so reasonable. We'd all get a bus back to Jimmy's, about six miles outside of Birmingham. And um, it's in Birmingham, outside the city centre. We'd go back to gyms, be about 20 of us, and we'd just stay up all night talking, listening to music, talking, listening to music, until eventually crash out and get up in the morning and all go our own ways. Luckily for me, it was in Kings Norton. So that's where I was from. So it was a walk back to my parents. Bill had to get bus back to Birmingham, coach back to Liverpool. But anyway, we kept in touch. And I remember giving Bill a call one day to say, um, looking for a guitarist, Bill. I said, would you join? Are you interested? And um, he just said, I'd love to. But he said, uh, you're going to have to come to Liverpool to practice. Um, I don't think my parents will let me come to Birmingham. Oh, it was great. Bill was like 16, just turning 17. He was about God. to start university. He was about to start university to do his degree. And, you know, how, how cool of his parents. And very middle class, hard work, but very middle class parents, mother, beautiful mother. She, gosh, she made a killer pea soup, I remember. She treated us. And we were vegans back then. Different <laughs> vegans, not like today. Not the lifestyle <laughs> vegans today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a little bit different. But anyway, and it was hard work being a vegan back then. But anyway, put, put that aside. Um, his mum was... Um, a head teacher so you know up there his dad was a manager of a petrol a um petrol um what's the word Pe petroleum um chemical company very big company uh multinational <laughs> company and so yeah bill fantastic big house and he said, Mick, if you can come to Birmingham, bring your songs with you. So I did. I took him the, all these tracks. I'd I told him, I said, look, we'll learn the A-side of Scum. And I've written all these tracks to to do this recording for a B-side. We're going to put it together. It's going to come out on E8 Records. And that was it. I went down to Liverpool, two sessions. 
and uh, stayed with him two two weekends, and uh, he just had a groove build. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. He just, I think, you know, Bill came from metal, so he had a certain tightness and a discipline. But Bill loved his punk, and he loved his, you know, his extreme metal, his death metal. So he loved. There's just something I think Bill taking that approach, loved his disorder, loved his discharge. Well, his band, Disattack, his first band, Disattack, dis, total discharge clone, you know what I mean? Yeah. They call it D-beat today, you know what I mean? But it, we, it's discharge, D-beat, I don't care for that. Discharge beat. Okay, D-beat for short, but it's discharge beat. But anyway, sorry. <laughs> that was simple. I go and jam with Bill. It just, it clicked. It clicked. And the thing with Bill... He was and always was the sort of permanent standing guitarist for Napalm. He was never the official. He didn't take over Justin. We just, I just asked him, will you help us out? Because I knew he had, cut, he was starting to do Carcass. And I knew at some point that would go where it would and he'd follow his own path. But so much respect to Bill. For me, the best recordings of Napalm. I'm sorry, I have to say it. They were. It was a different unit. It was a different dynamic. We were young. We were naive. We were just full of that energy, you know what I mean? Which I'm sorry, it's... I'm not saying you can't have it now, but it's just something about that young energy that mm. we, we captured. This unit, it was... We weren't tight, as I always said. I couldn't play, but none of us could sort of, like... If you put us to a metronome, you think get it, no way, there was no clicks, we just went in, one, two, three, four, first take, next track, that's how we did it, that's how we did it, Bill would double track his guitar, we do the vocal mix, get out of there, there was no luxury back then of, you know, money, you know, to spend days, you know what I mean, it was hours we were talking about, and you know, so we know, you know there was, there was no bloody computers then, the luxury they have today to cut and paste and chop and do as many takes. So that's why it is what it is. And I'm really grateful I had that experience. Yeah, I'm grateful of the whole the whole thing from where I came from, from punk. I'm so glad that I was a loner, that the kids in the street wouldn't let me play football. You know, finding out I was adopted and that all had a big impact it did. And it was like, right, I've got music. And it was punk that I found. There was that energy in punk that, you know, maybe I had an anger. And well, there was an anger and a frustration there, you know, finding out things like adoption and not having friends. And even at school, I struggled. I thought, is it me? And, he, he, you know, he, un, you know oh, OK, I wasn't back then saying I was hyper. I understand that now and maybe a bit too much for people. But still, no one ever gave me the chance. Napalm gave me that. It was the first time I felt part of something and put everything into it. Best days ever. Absolutely killer. Wouldn't take that away for nothing. I bet, man. That's that's incredible. And uh, I was I was going to ask you because it was um, Napalm. You know, was was just so extreme, so fast, and everything. And then you kind of like look into your shift into ambient music after that with Lol and, and Scorn was heavy, you know, at first. But even then, it eventually kind of turned into that. But but after talking to you for a minute, I see how you look at the bass the same way that you do like just the, the fast music. Like it's like to, to to you is your ambient music just as extreme, but just in a different way. You know. Well, you know, for me, for the whole ambient thing, you know, discovery, you know, when, when I first heard Brian Eno and, and especially the ambient works, just to me, I just called it drifting drone music, you know, before the word drone, you know, uh-huh. as it is today. And, you know, discovering, you know, a lot of other, you know, experimental artists, you know, think, you know like Nurse with Wound and Lost Mord and, you know, Arcane Device, people that I get for me were just pushing, you know, you know it wasn't called sound design then, but just, just pushing tones and playing with frequencies, half the trio. Again, Zoviet France, you know, definitely half the trio. Some of their recordings, subsonic, you know what I mean? A nice pair of speakers always helped, you know what I mean? And a subwoofer, definitely. So that, that for me, I just, it was that expanse. And I just, I was attracted to it, you know, just creating these imaginary landscapes. And I think the whole bass thing just was what attracted me rather than melody, and, you know, the high sounds and the mid sounds, which are in there, they're all part of the drift, as I call it. There's something about that rumbling foundation, which just attracted me, that bass. And that's the same with Scorn, you know what I mean? Scorn, we made that decision, me and Nick, we wanted that sub bass, that dub bass, that cyclic bass, that jar wobble 
public image again, not ashamed to, you know, big influence for us in those early days. And then when I went, had, you know, had to go solo, you know, to continue with Scorn after the Evanescence album, um, well, the Ellipsis what was a remix um, record mix. So after Evanescence, you know, doing Gyro myself, you know, I had to think about this. I wasn't going to get another bass player, um, you know, to take over Nick. And that's when I made the decision, well, the whole thing is going to be samples from now on, Mick. You're not playing the drums no more. You were never comfortable. You know, you, you weren't a funk drummer. You weren't, you know, you can't play your ghost notes. You're bish bash about punk rock drummer. I couldn't play funky beats to save my life. So that's why I got, <laughs> hey, I couldn't, that's why you know, I got into sampling. For me, I like to hit pads, play with drum machines. It works for me. That works for me. It's stripped down, yes, but that's what works for me. My drumming was minimally napalm. It was just, a different dynamic it was blasting but it was still very fucking basic sorry it was still very very basic um it was just that's the style and i think you know what i do now there is a style there that i like that atmosphere i like that solid beat but that bass that foundation of just suck you in pull you down and you get the right pa system and uh Lovely. <laughs> so, I mean, even, St even Stephen O'Malley is a big fan. You know, he he invited me to uh, one of his um, to support Sono back in 2011 in Tilburg in um, Holland, and I remember saying no. I said, oh, I don't know where I fit into this, Steve. And I knew he was a fan of my sound, and he said, Mick, you fit in, okay? It's I'm inviting you as a guest. You know we love you and your music. You know we love your bass. And I said, that's good enough for me. If the audience doesn't like it, you, it's, I'm doing it because you've invited me. But, yeah, it was an interesting show, you know, playing with amongst a lot of, you know, metal acts and drone acts and there I'm thrown on, you know, by myself. And it went down well. I think they got into it. You know what I mean? Big bass, dubbed up and, yeah. You know what I mean? How nice. You know what I mean? So... Good That's stuff. great. Speaking of <laughs> speaking of uh, not fitting into a metal crowd or anything, not uh, some people do, but not a lot of people really follow John Zorn or anything like that. And there's a whole lot of people that don't know that you played in Painkiller uh, with Zorn. What was that like? Uh, yeah, going just full full on saxophone, jazz, freak out. Zorn appears. I'm told by Martin Nesbitt, who used to work at Ear Eight Records. Uh -huh. He was like their press and A and R, real real cool guy. Real, real cool, cool guy from Nottingham, Total Music Head. He had recently turned me on to Naked City, but prior to that, he turned me on uh, to which I guess would, would have been my first John Zorn experience. And it's John Zorn plays the songs of Ornette Coleman. And it's just two songs, this is. And it's got four players, and this is a killer recording. It's got saxophone left, saxophone right, drum left, drum right, four different players. So two different drummers, two different saxophone That's players. Crazy. And I end up in New York. Um, so January of 91. And I say, John, I'm here. Should we meet up? And he's like, yeah, let's go. Let's go record shopping. Let's eat. So we meet. We meet at Bleaker Bob's, I think. And um, he said, right. He said, what do you want to eat? And I said, well, whatever. So he said, right, well, record shops, I'll take you to some stores. So that's when I realized where, what I call person to go record shopping with. So we just have this talk. He's just like, you're here. Um, do you want to come in the studio with me? And I'm like, I've never done that sort of thing before. And he goes, it'd be fine, man. We'll just go in and we'll kill it. And, uh, you know, you can imagine I'm like, you know, I've never done that. I've never improvised. I've done napalm. I've done sort of structure themes. So I mentioned Bill Laswell. And I've just recently been turned on to Bill Laswell's last exit. And so I could see the connection. And I've been told about Bill Laswell was a napalm death fan. So to cut the story short, I tell Laswell, I tell Zorn, um, I've heard about this bloke, Bill Laswell, in New York with a studio, and that was it. Zorn just was like, classic Zorn, more animated. He like goes, sick, let me give him a call. And he said, he's got a, he said, I haven't spoke to Bill in like a year. And he said, yeah, let me give him a call. Let's get in the studio. And it was just like that. So he said, right, let's go and get some drumsticks, Mick, and I'll be in touch in the next 24 hours. And he did, he gave me a telephone call. And um, I was at Plotkins at the time, and... I was over in New Jersey. No, 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 no. I was in New York because Jim had moved from New Jersey's parents to New York because he was doing an audio course. 
And he was right in the heart of New York. So Zorn calls up and he said, right, we've got the studio on this date. And I'm like, oh, wow, I fly on that morning and back back to England. And he said, I said, no, no. And he said, I've got three hours booked. And I'm like, wow, three hours. And he said, right, this is my address. Get a taxi with Plotkin. Pick me up and then we'll go to Brooklyn, Greenpoint. And that was it. I get in this taxi with Jim. We pick John up, you know, and oh, man, cool. You know, he's, he's all over excited and... Yeah, we we're having a little talk between us. We get there to the studio, and I'm a little nervous, okay? I don't usually get nervous, but no, no, nervous, just a little like, what's going on here? This is a different situation, but at least I've met Zorn, haven't I? But I've never met Laswell. I've only heard this music. I'm being told, last exit, I'm being to, and then didn't have the internet back then, so it was only a word of mouth. Oh, he's produced this, he's engineered that, so... I only knew a little bit, but what I heard was, yeah, yeah, I get this. Hence why I told Zorn and it ended up happening. So that's it. We arrive. Oz Fritz is there. And, you know, we can't take Oz Fritz out of the equation. He was the fourth man. No Oz Fritz, no painkiller. Because Oz Fritz was the desk pusher, studio and live. He really, I learned a lot from Oz. Lovely guy. But anyway, that was it. We turn up. Zorn and Laswell not met each other for a year. They start talking. I think I'm just introduced to, to Laswell quickly. He grabs me, asks Fritz, and he said, look, Mick, is there a drum kit here that takes you? you and, I, and it was this open plan studio. I've never seen anything like that before other than the BBC. So it's this loft top, um, loft top warehouse just with the beat, with the steel girders through. And there's all the equipment. There's all the master tapes of all these classics that he's done from Whitney Houston material, you know, public image, motorhead, there's, you know, the, the Rolling Stones, there's all sorts, and I'm like, wow, look at this place, and there's just all sorts of keyboards, guitars, basses, percussion, the drums, so I just go, yeah, that drum kit will do, and I always used it, it was this green five-piece Yamaha kit, it just looked fine, ride, uh, ride, crash, crash, hats, simple. I was happy. I said, yeah, that will do. So he said, right, put some cans on. We'll check you. The check was like minutes. You know what I mean? It was not like, dun, dun, right, dun, yeah. dun. It was like minutes. He had the sound, you know what I mean? And then before I knew it, Zorn just said, right, Mick, come here. He said, right, what we're going to do, we're just going to run the tape and we're just going to record and I'll record what? And Zorn just said, don't worry, we're just going to record. <laughs> That's it, okay? That's amazing. Two hours later, yeah, two hours later, two and a half hours later, it's time to leave the studio. I've got to get back into New York, pack my bags, and it was only a three-hour session because get ready for it, classic last one. As soon as that session, it was, I think... It was a night. It was. It was a nine till midnight session. Bill was then taking over a Pharaoh Saunders session. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, he had a mix. So yeah, it was like right. Let's get this recording session in. Then after that, I've got a mix session of a Pharaoh Saunders project that I'm working on. So it was an eye opener. Okay, that moment at that studio session, Bill Laswell taught me. Um, one big, one big lesson about the mixing board, and the big lesson was, and I've had this battle. I'm not going to name people, but I've had a big battle with people that go on about headroom and don't care. And my lesson was, I don't care for headroom. I don't gain stage staying. That's not how I work. You well, I think you can hear that in my bad production. <laughs> whatever, but whatever with the bad production, it's it's like my bad drumming. That's what it was. My bad engineering that's what it is it's hate it like it. i don't know i don't know it is what it is but bill taught me at that session i remember hearing this drum sound and it was so alive which it is on that first paint well on all the painkillers but i've never heard all the cymbal splash nothing was over compressed or gated horribly and i just remember looking at the mix and it was just it was all in the red and it was nearly exploding, you know, it's like exaggeration, but it was like, you know, sparks were coming off the finger. It was like, wow, look, I've never seen a mixing. Usually the engineers are very Absolutely. conservative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, guys, turn down now, we're turning up. And this is the thing I learned with Bill. I remember looking at Bill and just saying, sort of, is it okay? You know, because it was all what it was doing. And he just, he like shrugged and he said, sound good. And I just said, best drum sound I've ever had. And he, <laughs> I, yeah, and he just shrugged again, and it was just, you know, we, we 
first time meeting Bill. He's not a man of many words, and certainly myself. But you know, we he, we loosened up through the years that we got to know each other and build a real nice relationship. And but you know, that first session was just yeah, that that's how it was. And that, as I say, going back to that, it's what taught me to this day that. It's what you hear. Don't worry about looking at the LEDs and how far the faders are up that they've gone past. Oh, you're getting close to zero. Don't worry, I'm going way. Mummy, I said this to somebody recently. My mixing board has got plus 36. Well, I'm sorry. If Soundcraft shipped it with plus 36, it's there for a reason because I can go plus 36. Sorry for the rant. <laughs> no, no, that's beautiful. I mean, seriously, like, no, I, I don't think I've talked to anybody that feels that way. <laughs> that's music music, music has to be that put, and that's what I heard from them early days of Peel. I heard music that was like, wow, this is a bit different. And that's just how I saw it. They were just pushing. And that's the only way I know. And luckily, I've been privileged and really privileged. And you know, I've never, I've never want any of that to go. That I've had those experiences that have all learnt me and shaped that journey from that little punk kid in his bedroom that had no friends, no friends at school, that found his friends with me playing music, with people that wanted to play music and extreme and push, and that was Napalm. They were my first friends, and it just, well, it's, it's where I am here. I'm very lucky to still go. To still do it and to still thoroughly enjoy it and, and more than ever now, I, I love pushing it. I can't wait to do gigs again, as we all know. It, it, it's been... It's been a mess, hasn't it? And it's still a bit of a mess, but hopefully some norm is going to come back and I'm looking forward to going out and doing gigs again because the shit hit just as I was about to go out and do gigs. I, I mean, Mark, yeah, same here, exactly. Yeah, yeah. and I mean, you're, you're, you have not stopped creating since you started, you know, and it's just been, and uh, even now, like more than ever, I don't, we don't have to talk about this if you don't want to, if you're waiting to announce it, but like with the new LOL LP coming out and with Scorn doing more heavy music and then uh, Blood of Heroes, uh, or I'm, I'm sorry, not Scorn, but uh, Blood of Heroes doing that, you know. Well, what happened is this it's simple thing. Lockdown comes. Helen got very worried. Is Mick going to sink or swim? And and it was a simple. God, he's got a lot in it. She got the heat. It's not that. <laughs> um, she, 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 she said to me straight, she said, Mick, try and be creative. Don't go down because all the gigs were off. She, you know, she knows me more than anyone. It was either go down and really wallow in it or make the most of it. And you know what? It's not a selfish, but being selfish, but it's the time and the luxury time that I've waited for for so long because I've never had this time to be able to be this creative and do what I want to do. It's been a horrible time. You know, my wife got COVID. It's not nice. You know what I mean? And, um, it's been nasty, hasn't it? But I really made the best of that time. I really did, and I've really enjoyed it. You know, I've learnt a lot um, about myself as well. Um, just certain things and being able to put certain things aside. And it's done me good in a lot of ways. It really has done me good. In a, but ultimately, musically, I've been able to focus. I've had that time. And it, it, that's all it was. There was... Well, what else can you do, Mick? I'd, every day I did a bit. I'd get my dad's newspaper. I'd do a little bit of shopping, and so I had this routine and did a bit of decorating in the house. But it was all, you know, Helen wanted me not. Don't get under my feet, Mick, because you know we don't. And no one needs that. But I can get under a feet and drive very insane. <laughs> I do that. I do that most days anyway. But um, it was like, look, Mick, go in the room. And I, you know, it's, I didn't really need her to tell me that. I came in and I dug deep and it's been good, you know. It's been really, really good. And, you know, it's it's not stopping. It's slowed down because I am back at work. You know, I am a part-time worker. Mm. I'm very lucky to have a job. It's that, it's that love-hate relationship again. I really wish I had the full time for the music. But I think I utilised that time because I thought, you're not going to get time like this again, Mick, to make right. music. Because do you know what? All that would have happened, there would have been a new scorn. Nothing else. Everything else that I've recorded over this 14, 15 month period, forget about it. A scorn I would have delivered because, you know, it was a two album uh, deal that me and Kurt struck up. So I knew I had to make a scorn. Nothing else would have happened. Yeah. Nothing. So, yeah, I'm, I'm very lucky again. I've, I've, I've been really lucky and. You know, lucky to have a party. You know, a lot say, God, you know, you know, 
you have a wife that tells you to go to your room and it's not bad, is it? You know what I mean? <laughs> get, get up under my feet, go to, you should have said, haven't you got music to do? Yeah. And that's what I say lately and I'm like, yeah, I think that's a hint. <laughs> that, that's beautiful. I did want to ask you, uh, because uh, I, I really enjoyed uh, the latest release that you did. It was, a collab- it was you submerged and uh, Cool Keith uh doing that record D- did you get to work with cool Keith? had you met him before or was that kind of done like all over the oh, internet and stuff right. like you know okay well, the simple thing there okay me and cool keith were going to do a record together in 2007 on own resistance that's when kurt built up a friendship with cool keith at the studio that keith visits and also the studio that kurt's involved with uh-huh. uh studio g and uh I regret not doing the record at the time, but it was going to be a hip hop sort of scorn, scorn in a hip hop sort of style, the earlier scorn, I guess, not the earlier, the mid period scorn, more the hip hop style, but with Cool Keith doing his thing. Doctor Doom is what I wanted to sort of do, okay? Uh-huh. I love the Doctor Doom stuff. Absolutely. So, yeah, love it. I'm sorry, it's stripped back. And I just saw some with, I thought, wow, if I could do like my scorn, beat and bass, a little melody. Keith do his thing because, wow, what killer lyricist, you know what I mean? Big Dr. Octagon fan. Now, you know, I didn't come I didn't come from hip-hop, so I can't speak of Ultramagnetics, etc. Now, I'm aware of all this. I've gone back. But for me, it was the Dr. Octagon where it really started and obviously the Dr. Doom. So it didn't happen. So we fast forward. Jason Williamson was meant to feature again on a track, Sleaford Mods, it, on, 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 on The Only Place. It didn't happen. Um, Kurt Neal was a little bit upset about it, and he said, "Look, Mick, let me ask Keith if you know if, if he'd be do if you do a track for you." And I said, "What? Not this track." I said, "This track I've already worked on for Jason. I sort of worked it around Jason's voice." And I said, "He said, no. Let me ask Keith. Do a new do a new track. Let's see what happens." And straight away, called Keith got back in touch with Kurt. Said, "Yeah, I like the idea of it. Send me the beat over." So I sent the whole track. He got the tempo. 24 hours, he'd been to the studio, booked in for two hours, uh, he'd written his lyrics, booked in for two hours, he did a main vocal, several uh, outtakes, overdubs, sent me the files back, I whacked it on the board, um, mixed it down, did a couple of versions, <laughs> that's it, I mean, it, it was done, killer experience, and, you know, it all happened so quick, and that's how I work, that's how Keith works, and I said to Kurt, you know, do, do I ask him what he thinks of the track? And he said, no, I've already asked him, Mick. He loves the track. He really loves it. And and then a day later, Keith emails me and he just said, uh, again, seems very small, man, man of small, very few words. And he just said, um, cool track. I'd like to work with you again. So I was like, oh, man, that's a lovely email. You know what I mean? So I just wrote back, take care. Let's stay in touch. Peace, Mick Harris. And that was it. And so since then, Kurt knows, let's get it together this time. You know what I mean? So You have to you know, do we that. Can't, <laughs> I, I really want to hear that record. <laughs> we, we, can, we can say that that is going to happen because Kurt will make that happen more than me and Keith. But it seems Keith was really happy with the beat, as he called it. And I'm really happy with what Keith delivered and and with Kurt. It was just a simple thing. Kurt had asked to provide some live bass and I said, sure, send some over. I'll use some live bass on one track. And it just happened to be the bass that he sent over just fit perfect with my my sample bass. The two talk together. So it become a three-way thing, didn't it? It worked perfect. And I'm sure I'm sure Kurt's gonna ask. Can I do some bass again, Mick, on this? And um, yeah, for sure you can. You know what I mean? You're a good kid, as I call him. You know what I mean? The kid. Well, he is, isn't he, Mick? He's twelve years younger than you, so and a bit more, <laughs> I think. So. Yeah, he's still the kid to me. Um, but yeah, that's a collaboration I really hope can happen because I think it's something that would work. And I love to say, going back to those Doctor Doom records, they are killer. I'm not saying it's going to be Doctor Doom, but you know what I'm saying. That sort mm. of strip down scorn thing and keep it just strip back with a little melody hook thing that keith can lock on to do his thing and i really want to do that that that's a vocal because i don't get to do many you know club not really anything do i so that's something i'd really enjoy doing really good challenge and something i know i'd really like to attack so fingers crossed for that 
Yeah, I, I will be looking forward to that until it comes out. I promise. Oh man, Dude, Mick, thanks so much for sitting down and like shining some light on on this old history. It's it's really fascinating to me, uh, just because you know that was all. Before the internet, before, you know, you could just, like, look up, you know, footage of anything and stuff. So I, I really appreciate you taking the time. As you know, it's, you know, my wife always says, none of us had digital cameras back then, did we? No one had mobile phones. Look at all, look what, to, it's instant today, isn't it? Snap, it's up. You know what I mean? Oh, look at all the footage we could have got. You know what I mean? There's the odd VHS. You know what I mean, we had a guy that used to come to the Mermaid, Andy, American Andy, we called him because he loved American hardcore and he had the bandana on as well. And Joe, you know, he was he, he was straight edge. He had the X's. He was a lovely lad, but he was the one guy that had a decent camera and he'd be at all the gigs constantly snapping. And I know one of my friends, he, he's in touch with him because, you know, he has published a lot of that stuff and he's just got so much of it sitting mm. about as you can and you know some of these photos featured on you know sleeves etc and but yeah none of us had cameras so you know nobody different world different time but i'm so glad i've been you know i came from that and still having a go now you know what i mean i'm still that manic little mick the punk you know what i mean you know i can tell <laughs> well man uh, anytime i have a musician on i always ask him if there's anything they'd like for uh for me to play or anything that they uh you know want to promote or do you think you have anything up your sleeve uh you want to drop on us or you want me to uh pick the cool keith track anything you want man if you have never heard this track it will make a lot of sense remember i told you about grind bass the band is called the membranes they're an english band they're on a label uh, creation before creation blew up to become what it you know become what it was with the likes of Oasis etc. But go back to this band 1984 and the EP a four track EP is called Death to Trad Rock and it's all killer. But there's one particular track on there and I had to submit a piece of artwork for a French gallery and it was called My Journey about where it all started and the whole grind bass was in there. Discharge was originally the first thing because that was just rainy, was just a killer bass player and he had that dirty, distorted sound. But to take it further, it is the bass sound on the membranes, Death to Trad Rock, but the actual track, the ultra track, you've got to, I know you're going to love it because I'm so, it's the sickest bass ever Shane loves it and I've turned a lot of people onto it as soon as they hear it they're like we get you Mick but the track The Kite Man The Kite Man by The Membranes check it maybe get back to me about your thoughts because I know you're going to look it's the sickest bass sound going distorted fuzz and overdriven and everything else with it it's the killer bass for me nothing to even Shane didn't get that bass sound and I'm not <laughs> knocking Shane Shane had a killer bass tone, you know what I mean? And on those peel sessions, definitely. But the Death to Trad Rock membranes, the Kite Man, check it out because I think you're going to love it. If you can get that track, play that for me, please. Absolutely. Dude, thank if you, you so that, much. Yes, I cannot so wait to listen to this. I, I'm, I'm always down to, uh, yeah, yeah, find something that I haven't heard please, before and dig in. Like I'm not going to like it because the band are interesting. It's wild music. And for me, this is a big influence for me as a person that shaped the whole thing and especially the bass, but the band themselves were unique. And John Robb himself is still about now. He does a huge online publication, Louder Than War. And uh, that's a massive online publication. Huge, huge, huge. So he's still about. He's still there. Big, A big player in the Manchester music scene. But check that track out. And if you could play that for me, I'd be so happy. Absolutely. Good mix. Seriously, thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time, man.
Thanks so much for tuning into the highway this week. A big shout out to Reverend Guitars, Railhammer Pickups, and Earthquaker Devices. If you liked what you heard, you can follow where you can follow, subscribe where you can subscribe, and if you want to go one step further, you can support us on Patreon at The Highway with Kyle Shutt. For a few bucks a month, you can help us keep this party going, get early access to next week's episode, and even get yourself a shout out. <laughs>